Hello, participant. It has been slightly under one year. I'm contractually obligated to invite you to the 14th volume of Good Design, Bad Design, where we talk about the good and bad of graphic design and visual communication in games. Things like menus, UI, UX, color choice, font choice, animation, character design. The kinds of things that touch on the presentation of information. Today, we've got some tutorial stuff and some things that might get lost in translation. You can start here and view the other volumes later. Also remember that these segments aren't reviews. Good games can have bad design components and vice versa. Got it? Okay, let's start by paying the bills. Today's episode sponsor is War Thunder. War Thunder is a free-to-play military vehicle combat game on PC, Xbox Series X and S, PS5, and the previous generation, and it's fully cross-platform. I lean towards the plane combat. I love the aerial dogfighting, flying next to a bunch of wingmates to take everyone out. But if tank combat is more your style, War Thunder has you covered. Or if you're into battles on the high seas, hey look, they've got battles on the high seas. Play with over 2,000 historically accurate tanks, helicopters, planes, and ships from every era over the last century. Click the link in the description to play War Thunder for free. Get a free bonus for registering too. Sign up now and you'll get a premium aircraft, tank, and ship, and a 7-day account boost to get you started right. Thanks, War Thunder. Good Design Nothing says presentation of information quite like a tutorial. That's like its whole job description right there. When you think about a tutorial, you think about something at the start of the game that tells you how to play, right? That's very important, but that's not the only place where a tutorial can be useful. A tutorial's job is to teach a player how to do something, especially if that something is subtle or not intuitive or tricky to understand in some way. For games with a lot of nuance to the combat, you can't teach everything all at once. The finer points will go right over a new player's head. But at some point, the subtle lessons have to be taught. What can you do to make some great tools for learning a game without sticking it all in a front-loaded tutorial? Splatoon 3 had to figure out a way to do just that. Splatoon 3's opening tutorial is quick and painless. It'll take you through the basics of the game at your own pace. If you're familiar with how Splatoon works already, there's even a shortcut where you can use the more advanced Squid Surge ability to climb up this wall and skip most of it. But the beginning tutorial is just the beginning. Splatoon 3 is full of complexity. The game isn't just about splatting everyone you see. You've got ink coverage, spray patterns, weapon range, damage output, and secondary weapon pairings. There are just a ton of important things to teach a new player, and front-loading it all is not going to work. The weapons in Splatoon 3 are very inventive, and they're not all things you can just understand inherently how they're going to operate. You need hands-on time to get a feel for things, and what better place to do it than in the match lobby? Splatoon 3 overhauled its match lobby to double as a hands-on training round. The previous games had training rooms, but you had to go there yourself. Now, while you're waiting for a match or for your friends to get online, the game gives you a space to test out every aspect of your current loadout. You've got stationary dummies for damage output, a huge floor to see how your weapon's spray charts work and how much ground they can cover quickly, there are moving targets to practice your tracking. The damage output numbers hovering over targets are a great graphical way to tell you exactly what you need to know about your new kit as you use it. As you play the game and unlock something you've never tried before, it's a quick thing to swap your loadout and get first-hand practice to see how a weapon works and how you can work it into the next match. And since you're already here waiting for the match to start, you might as well tinker around with it a little. The different game modes have their own unique spin on the idea. The Salmon Run lobby is like the normal game lobby, but it also lets you practice the unique Salmon Run mechanics while you wait. There's an egg and basket for the egg throw ability. There are different sized targets so you can practice against the salmoned enemies. You can even go into an empty map and practice against the special boss salmonids one at a time, without the chaos of the other enemies getting in your way. Splatoon 3's new lobby system makes it easier to practice, and helps give you the information you need at the time you're ready to take it in. Bad Design Getting the right info to players at the right time is the goal of any tutorial, but it's a tough goal. The most common ways to screw it up are to tell the player way too much or way too little. On one end is Sonic Unleashed, the Wii version. The 360 version is a totally different game, 
and its tutorials are just fine. The Wii version has short, isolated tutorials for every concept the game has. That sounds fine, until you find out that the list of concepts includes turning left and right. Every tutorial forces the game to load a new sectioned off area of the first stage, and your companion character goes into a speech about what to do, no matter how basic the idea is, even if you're already doing it. Complete this microscopic stage to prove you know how to jump, then how to turn, then like five or six more of those. There's no out and no shortcut you can take to prove you know what's what. Oh, and you get to go through this whole process again when you get to the second gameplay style. Now, being overly cautious with tutorials isn't a terrible idea, especially for a game that will be played by a younger audience. You'd never want to throw a player into a do-or-die situation without giving them the tools to get through it, and your tutorial has to work for players who have very different levels of skill with playing games. Being thorough guarantees that everyone will prove they know even the most basic concepts before they can get stuck somewhere. The problem in Sonic Unleashed is just about the degree of ceremony for the littlest things that bog down the process. The loading and unloading and the unskippable nature of it all make it a chore to get through. On the other end is the tutorial and driver. It's bad. Or rather, it would be bad if it existed. It's bad by default. The original driver has a notoriously hard opening sequence. The first mission puts you in a car inside a parking garage. You play as an undercover cop trying to get inside a crime ring by posing as their wheelman. To pass their test, you have to check off a list of driving stuns one by one. Okay, no problem. Wait, there's also a timer. That's a pretty short timer too. Uh oh, so how do you do these stunts? Why isn't this burnout working? What do you mean by slalom? Yeah, good luck. When you're in the parking garage, there aren't any instructions or how-tos, or even a way to see if you're doing the stunt in a way the game recognizes. It's pretty easy to look like you've done a reverse 180, but not the right kind. Until you complete the task while darting around, without wrecking the car on the poles, mind you, you're stuck here. The parking garage stage won't tell you this, but the manual says you're supposed to have done the separate training mode already, where you get to watch the game do the stunts for you. Even the fact that there is a training mode is a little tough to find in this stylish main menu. You have to resist the temptation to go right into the game. The parking garage segment is a test with no instruction, throwing whoever shows up directly into the deep end. Without clearly steering a new player into where the game expects you to pick up the right info, Driver's opening chapter can easily leave players stranded on the side of the road. Good Design Games about mystery are fun. Uncovering secrets to find the truth is incredibly satisfying, but that type of game is trickier to make than most. When you're trying to build a game about the joy of exploration, discovery, and mystery, how you roll out information to players can make or break the whole thing. On one side, you can't be too handholdy. The more you have a game point out, the less of that core discovery is left for players to do. But if you don't point out enough so a player could connect the dots themselves, that feels like a frustrating game where puzzle solutions come out of nowhere. You need a light touch if you want the player to have a good time connecting the dots. Tunic finds that balance. Tunic is a game all about discovery in a fashion similar to the original NES Zelda. You wash up on a beach in a mysterious land and are expected to figure things out from there. You have a large amount of freedom of where you can go at the start, including places you aren't prepared for yet. And everything you find on the island is part of a big mystery to solve. Tunic's nods to the original Zelda go beyond the aesthetics and non-linear structure though. The game gives you little clues through collectible pages of an in-game instruction book. The book's graphic design harkens back to physical instruction books. There are even little marks drawn in pencil that make it look like someone else had been playing the game and making notes along the way, and you're just picking up where they left off. These manual pages all have tiny pieces of information about the world, the game's mechanics, and special features you have to connect yourself. There's info on where key items are, how to upgrade your stats, maps of dungeons, combat mechanics, enemy behaviors, and tips. The manual isn't just written normally though. A lot of it is in a symbolic language that you have to decipher over the course of the game. The whole thing is a nod to the bygone era of instruction manual tutorialization, where games sometimes relied heavily on the physical books that came with most games rather than putting necessary information to play within the game itself. Yet, the game figured out how to update that concept to work in a modern context. 
Tunic strings you along with a collectible that does that job and helps keep the game's structure from becoming too frustrating to play. All the information you need is right there in front of you, but not exactly when you need it, and not in a way you can just read without working a little for it. If you took away that extra decoding step, the game would feel like it was spoon-feeding you answers. Take away the manual entirely, and the game would be unbelievably obtuse. By making the instructions part of the mystery uncovering process, Tunic put in a lot of work to present its information carefully, preserving the mystery and making it fun to solve. Bad Design Symbols are tricky things. They're all little games of misdirection. Anytime you use a symbol to communicate something, you're relying on whoever sees it to infer your meaning without explicitly explaining what it is you mean. Even in the best conditions, that's going to be super prone to miscommunication. But when you're working in a medium like video games, where the product is usually meant to be translated and localized across dozens of different cultures and languages, the risk of miscommunication goes up exponentially. Not every symbol means the same thing across cultures. Symbols are prone to getting lost in translation, the visual equivalent of a pop culture reference, if you don't think them through all the way. Like this fun little guy. Most of my audience is in the English-speaking world, so you might not know what this means in Japan. To me, as an American, this conveys the essence of Sprite. Hmm, Sprite. But this is called the Shoshincha mark, and it's the universal symbol for this car is driven by a new driver. In Japan, that symbol has become so ubiquitous, it's turned into a symbol that tries to communicate the idea of noviceness. In Japanese games, that inferred meaning pops up a lot. Like in Splatoon, the background of the first nameplate you get in Splatoon 3 has the Shoshinsha mark as part of its design. It's evoking that the player is a beginner. To the Japanese. To everyone else, it's just a cool design flourish thing. It got swapped out from the Are You a First Time Player screen in Kirby Superstar. It was used in some DDR games to indicate songs in the lowest difficulty mode that were especially easy to play. It's in Katamari Damacy as... Oh, there are just stickers here. That's fine. Now, this isn't a bad design as in it's ugly or anything. It's just that the symbol is not able to communicate the idea it's trying to communicate when it goes across cultures. The PlayStation controller layout ran into another example. The cross and circle symbols are widely used stand-ins for yes and no in Japan, which doesn't perfectly match up with their meanings outside of there. The circle is located on the right side of the 4-button layout, which is not where the usual confirmation button was located on popular consoles of the time. Often, that's what you'd hit if you wanted to cancel, without that cultural connection of a circle meaning yes, and without the implied layout hints of which location is for confirming, games that were localized all had to fend for themselves. You got a mishmash of some games leaving the circle button as confirm, and some switching it to cross. Worse yet, since their functions are directly opposed, if a player were to autopilot, they could easily do exactly the opposite action from what they wanted to do. A couple years ago, Sony made the non-Japanese behavior the standard for everybody, including Japan. I'm sure that's not confusing for anyone. Of course, translation can run into a similar problem sometimes. Kanji are symbols too, in a way. When they're partially used as decorative elements, they're sometimes just left untranslated. Each Minato symbol means something specific in Xenoblade, though trying to localize it in-game might not work too well. If you saw Buster written on the sword instead of this, that doesn't really have the same visual pop. Remember that localization isn't just about translation. These sorts of symbolic, cultural, and contextual quirks are part of the job, and make each game a unique challenge to release in a new market. Head down to the comments. We're looking for new ideas for the next episode of Good Design, Bad Design. If you got a beautiful artistic game, some clever UI system you haven't seen before, some real disastrous menu layouts, or anything else you want us to talk about, let us know. We've got other episodes in the playlist at the end of the video if you're looking for inspiration, or just want to see us tear down Gungnir's fonts again. That's always fun.